So first, I'd like to thank uh, Abdullah uh, and all the organizers um, for convening us here and to echo Stephen yesterday to all those whose labor has made this event possible. So in my brief time today, I'd like to talk about um, some of the legacies, norms, and infrastructures of violence that the global war on terror has produced, consolidated, and proliferated the world over, and which continue to expand in the supposed post-GWAT era, effectively troubling any clean distinction between the GWAT, post-GWAT period, and crucially, the centrality of the racialization of the Muslim body to the development of this quote-unquote counterterrorism regime. Um, and Deepa mentioned this quite eloquently yesterday, that the, racial, the racialization um, of the Muslim body as one predisposed to enact violence in some indeterminate future. It is this logic, the kind of presupposition of the Muslim quote unquote threat that has underwritten the development of a host of preemptive policing practices, surveillance regimes, laws, and modes of collective punishment um, that have become institutionalized over the last two decades. And indeed, Palestine is at the center of the story. So this kind of builds on some of the threads spoken about earlier today. And I'm incredibly jet lagged, so if I'm over time, just tell me, and I will curb my comments. Um, so moreover, it is not only the persistence and indeed uh, kind of proliferation of this legal war architecture into the present that I would argue um, troubles any clean distinction between kind of pre post GWAT era, but the specific logic on, what it is, on which it is built that the racialized other as one quote unquote pregnant with the pot potentiality of violence, which must be contained and intercepted, that really shores up the important point made yesterday by Stephen about the relationship between whiteness and racial and social order. It is this relationship that serves as a kind of justifying logic on which the so-called exceptional violence of the liberal security slash subtle colonial state is predicated. Um, and here I'm talking particularly about um, the development of the kind of US uh, counterterrorism infrastructure and security state, but this also is something exported um, around the world. And so uh, Nahed spoke a little bit yesterday about a kind of similar phenomenon in the Greek context regarding how the the category of a potentially dangerous person is inscribed in German law. This is something we're seeing reproduced across various national regimes. So the point here is that this hyper invisibility um, of the Muslim racialized other serves as a kind of convenient construction against which to develop a rather terrifying preemptive architecture of war, policing, and criminalization that is exercised not only on Muslim bodies and populations, but also increasingly on indigenous and climate activists, Palestine solidarity activists, and other political dissidents and protesters. So to tell the story, um, I actually want to dwell ironically primarily in the 1990s, um, as this is the really crucial decade in which the tools for the war on terror are constructed. And Palestine and the figure of the Palestinian constructed as a so, so, per, so presumed terrorist serves as a key refracting point. Um, that's what I really want to hear kind of expand the timescape and the geographical scope of how we conceptualize the war on terror. And to begin, I want to take us to the border between Israel and the Gaza Strip. So in January of 1993, Mohammed Salah, not the famed football player, but the, uh, a Palestinian American citizen and Chicago resident, traveled to the Gaza Strip. At the Arab checkpoint on the Gaza border, he was blindfolded, shackled, and thrown into an Israeli military jeep. Hours later, he was deposited at the Shin Beit, the Israeli security agency interrogation center in Ramallah. Salah was held for nearly five years in military prison, during which time a confession was extracted under torture. Israel alleged he was a Hamas operative carrying funds to be distributed to the organization, the movement. Salah and his lawyers maintained he was delivering humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip. Days after Salah's arrest, Israel announced that it had captured, quote, a top Hamas military commander, end quote, and further declared that the Hamas leadership um, had moved its military command center to the United States. Presenting Salah as proof of its charge, Israel pressured the U.S. to outlaw Hamas and criminalize transnational networks of support to it. The U.S. government, however, found no evidence to corroborate the claim that Salah had in fact been the head of a U.S.-based Hamas cell or anything close to it, and pursued no further action at that point. The U.S. position, however, would change course with the onset of the global war on terror eight years later. Salah and his plight sit at the center of an evolving uh, legal war architecture that would later constitute a central means through which the war on terror would be waged. So while Salah was imprisoned in Israel, a much celebrated handshake halfway around the world would take place. On September 13, 1993, 
uh, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat signed the Oslo Accords on the White House lawn, inaugurating the beginning of the Oslo peace process. Hailed by many as a historic move towards peace, more sober analyses such as those well known by Edward Said among others, foresaw the agreement as a quote, instrument of a, Palestin a Palestinian surrender of Palestinian Versailles, end quote. Arafat's Fatah movement and the dominant party in the newly formed PA, Palestinian Authority, largely supported the accords, but Hamas, along with other Islamist and leftist political parties, opposed it. The Oslo Accords sits at the center of what would roughly a decade later become a centerpiece of the global war on terror. I'm arguing it's a central component that often does not get sort of the attention it deserves. As part of a broader strategy to shore up the post-Cold War geopolitical arrangement amenable to U.S. interests globally and the Middle East specifically, in 1995, President Bill Clinton signed Executive Order 12947, which blocked assets in the United States to, uh, of, quote, terrorists who threatened to disrupt the Middle East peace process, end quote. <clears throat> and, and he does this under his authority under a law I won't talk about here, but under the 1997 um, Emergency Economic Powers Act, i.e. EPA, um, which authorizes the president to impose economic sanctions to deal with a declared threat to national security. Um, so here, interestingly enough, the Oslo Accords constitutes part of that category, which is an interesting kind of bordering of the U.S. security state. So EO 12947 um, imposes U.S. sanctions on the newly designated entities and prohibits transactions with them. Significantly, even as the regulatory powers of IEPA um, were predominantly used against foreign governments, including Sudan, Burma, Libya, Iran, and others, um, and against individuals and entities only if they were citizens of sanctioned foreign nations. In 1995, Clinton extends its use beyond foreign countries to organizations and individuals suspected of having terrorist ties, and notably those linked to Palestine and the Palestinians. So Clinton's order identified 12 organizations it deemed to pose a threat to Oslo, including Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and Hezbollah, as well as 18 individuals associated with them as, quote, specially designated terrorists, or SDTs. So this marks the beginning of a shift to a list-based approach to criminalizing support for terrorism, wherein any support to or contact with a blacklisted entity is rendered criminal under U.S. law. It moreover set into motion a process that ultimately culminated in the passage of the U.S. material support ban in 1996 um, and with the Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act, AEDPA. A secret cable released one day after Clinton signed this executive order revealed that he would be undertaking two important initiatives to combat the, quote, global terrorist threat broadly and to, and to counter, quote, the danger of terrorism to the peace process, or Oslo specifically. So Israel-Palestine is firmly at the center of an evolving U.S. terrorism law and policy infrastructure, and it is in this period that the U.S. terrorism list is born, and it is this list that has now expanded to thousands upon thousands of entries post-9-11. So meanwhile, Saleh, while incarcerated in Israel and without knowing of the evidence used against him, was designated a, quote, specially designated terrorist, SDT, by the U.S. government. He was the first U.S. citizen to bear that designation. Not long after citizens signed this executive order into force, a pivotal event in the U.S. would consolidate support in U.S. Congress for a legislative action around, quote, the problem of terrorism, which is Oklahoma City. So for those in the U.S., this will be something quite familiar. In 1995, two American citizens, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, bombed the um, Alfred P. Murrah building in Oklahoma City, which created the political climate in U.S. Congress for the passage of the Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act, that is, the material support ban. It is here that the U.S. Material Support Clause comes into being and that is enacted upon by the Patriot Act and other laws passed post-9-11 in 1996. It is here that this, uh, this, the statute comes into being. So irrespective of the fact that Oklahoma City was a domestic act of terrorism, as mentioned you know, yesterday, congressional hearings in the wake of the bombing focused almost exclusively on, quote, the threat of international terrorism. One of the key drafters of the proposed act made a direct link to the ominous, quote, Islamic threat that seeks to both disrupt the Oslo Accords underway in Palestine, Israel, and create turmoil around the world. The expansion of the terrorism financing, financing legal regime throughout the 1990s and the broad powers it afforded to criminalize acts that might occur, so not that, but that might, created the legal foundation on which the post-9-11 doctrine of preemption directly builds. So it's here that we can insert 9-11. So I'm arguing that this 1990s period and Palestine are really central here to this story. And um, 
what I want to focus on, or what I focus on in my book is what I'll talk about now, um, is this sort of little known war um, that is incredibly insidious and that deserves more attention in our analysis of, of kind of GWAT. So insert 9-11, right, um, on, on um, September 24th, 2001, so directly after, um, U.S. President George Bush announced the following, quote, Good morning. At 12.01 a.m. this morning, a major thrust of our war and terrorism began with the stroke of a pen. Today, we have launched a strike on the financial foundation of the Global Terror Network. With these words, Bush signed into force Executive Order 13224, an emergency declaration that allowed the president to put in place an extensive program to attack terrorism financing, which would have, reverber which would have reverberations across the globe. EO 13224, merely one instrument in a much broader law war complex, created a list of specially designated global terrorists, or SG, G, SDGTs, um, which authorized the, the Treasury to block the assets and ban all transactions with these designated entities, as well as their sort of, quote, front organizations, anyone associated with them. It's an incredibly expansive net that this, this order um, really kind of circumscribes. And it's really this that's built on, that all the sort of banking, de-risking stuff, and all this, the stuff that we see in, sort of enforced today is kind of connected to this infrastructure, right? This list is just a beginning, Bush warned. So um, this sort of builds on that 1990s um, infrastructure I was talking about. And this executive order confers especially broad powers on the US Treasury to target the material support um, uh, infrastructure of the global terror networks, casting an ever-expansive net, wide net, on who and what can be prosecuted by the U.S. security state. This body of law and the policing and surveillance infrastructures it requires to enforce, so sanctions lists, uh, sanctions regimes, blacklists, all that stuff, has been reproduced across the globe post 9-11. So these kinds of like legal instruments, um, terrorism lists, sanctions, banking and regulatory regimes, to govern financial flows in accordance with these laws um, have proliferated in the decades since Bush's little known EO uh, order, right? To become a kind of key feature of the post 9 11 uh, political juridical order. Today, most states and supranational institutions host their own respective terrorism lists and have passed emergency laws criminalizing an expansive array of activity deemed to be associated with, quote, material support for terrorism, giving rise to new regimes of global security law. So for instance, the UN Security Council for One has instituted binding resolutions that require member states to pass terrorism financing measures and freeze the assets of those purportedly linked to terrorism. Meanwhile, the US tethers its material support law um, to all of its financial and aid transactions around the world, effectively giving um, rise to what I call in my book, elastic sovereignty. I can talk about that in Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, so too do these processes for designees listed um, on its uh, sanctions list rely, I'm sorry, so too do um, the kind of sanctions regimes in the UN decision making process for designating terrorists rely in part on US material, intelligence materials. Meanwhile, Israel's 2000 terrorism law, which builds on the associational logic that underwrites U.S. material support statutes, was recently deployed by Israel's Ministry of Defense to shut down six prominent Palestinian human rights organizations after designating them as terrorist organizations in October 2021. More broadly, governments, authoritarian and democratic alike, um, and certainly liberal democratic states are imbued with violence as any other. There's no sort of I sort of want to dispel of that, that they're sort of outside of violence, right? Um, that democratic and uh, authoritarian regimes alike have mobilized counterterrorism laws, terrorism designations, blacklists, and sanctions regimes to criminalize and pacify recalcitrant political forces they deem as threatening to their rule. So the war on the financial foundation of terror, as Bush framed it nearly two decades ago, has metastasized the world over, proliferating through new domains and encompassing greater swaths of activity from banking transactions to aid and humanitarian relief to popular movements and so on. And uh, this is something that fossil fuel industries are actually picking up and now using to sort of use against a lot of the climate justice activists as well. It's a new trend. Um, or not new, but it's something that's certainly being expanded upon. So it is this body of law um, and the norms that has consolidated um, that have really become a central feature of the so-called post-9-11 political juridical order. Um, and I, I'm arguing that we have to really look at this if we're going to be declaring any kind of post and that this is something that we sort of need to be focusing on analytically. 
Uh, accordingly, any genuine declared post to GEO would require the abolition or the abolishment of this legal regime of racialized violence, and as such, the entire security apparatus on, on which it is predicated. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your invitation to speak at this important event. In the short time allowed, I wish mainly to raise some fundamental questions rather than to answer any. I, I feel a bit like an imposter on a um, war on terror uh, panel because I'm going to talk about the war of terror against Palestine, of course. Uh, and of course, this is how the panel started just now. Um, over the past decades, me and my Palestinian and Israeli anti-Zionist friends and colleagues had to get used to a peculiar set of misconceptions about Islamophobia in Western cultures, due probably to many centuries of Orientalist biases. While our Western colleagues uh, could not, uh, could and do understand and appreciate that Christianity has been systematically and chronically Judeophobic over the centuries, Christian understanding of Islamophobia seems limited and partial, sometimes ahistorical. Even more contentious is explaining the complex relationship between Zionism and Islamophobia and the various Israeli-led initiatives like IRA so successfully tainting any criticism of Israel and its cruel occupation as anti-Semitic, making free speech on the topic impossible. The false continuum, Zionist state, Jewish state, state of all Jews, is reflecting uh, the other popular equation, Jew equals Israeli equals Zionist and has flummoxed and silenced many progressive academics and intellectuals, artists, and politicians. It is easy to forget that most Zionists are indeed Christian and live in the United States, or that uh, Christian Zionism has preceded uh, Jewish political Zionism by many decades. If criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic, as the IHRA has so toxically decreed, how are people to understand and react to the settler colonial militarized control of Palestine, or Israeli extrajudicial murders, or the continuing war crimes committed by Israel? How do they do it um, without getting into trouble? Any such criticism faces the wrath of the Israeli propaganda machine and likely to be banned and prosecuted as anti-Semitic due to the unthinking acceptance and adoption of IRA as a package of weaponizing anti-Semitism, the many Zionists who are spreading Islamophobia can rest assured nothing will happen to them. Um, for the rest of us, criticizing Israel has cost many academics their jobs and careers and it's also um, happened to a growing number of left politicians in Britain, which I'm sure you heard of. We owe it to uh, Edward Said, um, our, uh, the, uh, our understanding of the connections between Zionism and Orientalism, and ultimately between Zionism and Islamophobia. Zionism has always distanced itself and its supposed opposition to anti-Semitism because it's not really opposing anti-Semitism, from the struggle against other forms of racism and prejudice, and especially separated itself from opposition to Islamophobia. Indeed, among the many Western intellectuals who Said notes as the modern proponents of Western Islamophobic and Orientalist ideologies, Zionists are leading the pack. He concentrates on the role of Bernard Lewis, obviously, the Orientalist and Arabist who became a leading voice of the Islamophobes among the neocons and the American Century Project, with others following his lead, such as Wistrick, 
Foxman, Chesler, Forster, and Epstein, and in France, Dagief, Henri Lévy, and Finkiel Kraut, and I'm not even mentioning Pamela Geller and people like that. Um, such Zionist investment in promoting and spreading Orientalist zeitgeist are integral to Western capitalism and a product of modernity, though the roots are much older, of course. The fear and loathing towards Muslims and Arabs was spreading as the Muslim waves continued radiating north, east, and west from Arabia, seemingly unstoppable. As the Muslim forces, more modern and better motivated and supplied, took control of much of the so-called known world, Europe has barricaded itself against the barbarians and the heathens, uh, leading, the popular in, leading to the popular emergence of the military, cultural, and social reaction we generally call uh, the Crusades. Hence, Europe was struggling against two supposedly sinister others. The internal Jewish other, uh, if you want a thorn in the Christian flesh, as they were called, and the external Muslim other, the enemy at the gate. Uh, starting with the Al-Andalus period, many European cultures, especially Southern European Catholicism, experienced various forms of Muslim invasion and control. They treated the obvious bond between Muslims and Jews during the centuries of convivencia in Spain and many other places um, as a double bind, an anti-Christian alliance. The false utterance, this false utterance was a demonization of the great achievement of Al-Andalus without which Europe's renaissance would be unthinkable. This was the intentional misreading, denying the positive and progressive cultural, artistic, and scientific peaks achieved by the Arab and Muslim regimes on the southern verges of Europe. There is also an interesting historical interpretation for this Christian hostility. Europeans, probably felt boxed in between the Jewish progenitors of Christianity and the Muslim modernizers of its obtuse conservative religiosity, which brought about the Dark Ages. In that sense, Christian solipsistic flat earthism, if you want, um, was besieged not just by the geographic and spatial inner, outer combination uh, of others, but also by the temporal aspect of this seeming blockade between Judaism, which preceded them, and Islam, which seems to competitively sweep masses of new, new converts. Arabs and Muslims were the pre precursors of things to come with an openness and dynamism so lacking in European Christianity. I hope I don't offend anyone. Uh, the Crusades offered no real closure to the sense of cultural and socio-political siege uh, beleaguering Christianity, and it would require centuries of adopting the scientific and philosophic knowledge of Al-Andalus and other Muslim centers for Europeans to emerge from the dark eons of the Middle Ages into the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Uh, we already heard about the very problematic nature of that period, uh, but, it is, uh, but it, it is about a short, uh, it brought about, sorry, it brought about a short period of interest in the history cultures and languages of the Middle East responsible, among other benefits, for the emergence of modern archaeology and the rise of theories about what Renan and others called the Semites and Semitism. And then, you know, it seems for a while in European culture, Jews and Muslims are residing together within that concept. This manifested as a scientific outpost of the earlier racism in the form of Orientalism, 
uh, which is knowledge necessary for control, serving the modern um, uh, interdependent practices of slavery, emerging capitalism, colonialism, and imperialism, more recently extended via globalism and financialization of the economies. This uh, profit uh, the developed mainly Western, mainly Anglophone center at the cost um, of, huge, of the huge periphery, at least until very recently. This is obviously a spent force, I would argue, on the way out, um, and, um, or at least, um, sorry, which is fighting to stop or at least to slow down the decline of the West. Hence, the abundance of Islamophobic narratives and regulations. Historically, we can pinpoint the moment when Christian animosity towards Muslims and Jews, uh, actually, turns from an interfaith conflict between competing religions into a modern form of racism marked by blood, what we call DNA today, yeah? rather than by competing faith. The best proof exists in the latter pages of Cervantes' Don Quixote. Uh, please ask me later. I, I don't want to go into details, but um, this is interesting because it is supposedly the first novel, and it is deeply Islamophobic uh, in, in, a, in a modern sense, not in, in the sense of you know, one religion against another. The continued, the continued waves of Jews expelled from pillar to post in Europe have finally led to the emergence of political Zionism appearing at the end of the 19th century and Islamophobic by definition, insisting on clearing Palestine of its Arab population. This is from its inception. It could do so in the 20th century only because it served a number of functions and masters uh, crucial for Western control of the South and East. Thus, the, uh, thus has Europe solved what was termed the Jewish question by exterminating most of them and exporting the rest to Palestine to build a Zionist racist state. To begin with, Zionism fatally fractured the deep and durable connections between Muslims and Jews, going back to the formative period of Islam in Arabia and later in Andalus in the Middle East, and especially, of course, in Palestine and Iraq. The emergence of a foreign, mainly European implant in the Arab East, supposed, supported by various um, European empires, provided a crucial control machinery radiating from Palestine to other areas of the Middle East um, and built on the dispossession and expulsion of the Palestinians, but also assisting the powers that be in their imperial and neo-colonial designs. The father of Zionism, Theodor Herzl, described this project um, uh, and his political child as a modern European and Western bulwark against Asia, and one suspect also against pre-capitalist, the Asian mode of production uh, as defined by Marx, one of the most enlightened of Orientalists, and I'm saying this is a Marxist. By the end of the 19th century, with the halcyon days of colonialism over, Europeans were loath to populate the Middle East with Christian colons. Algeria being the exception proving the rule. So Zionism was a most useful political device of European expansion without uh, being visibly tied to the cultures from which it, is, it emerged. It spread its origin myth as an ancient Jewish entity, a total fabrication, a historical ideological distortion, a kind of biblical proof of land ownership. And to end, uh, as an example, consider the role of Israel as a tool against the tide of pan-Arabism during the 1950s, and especially its role 
in the failed neo-colonial adventure, uh, the attack on Nasserism during the Suez War. The defeating of Nasser um, that happened again in 1967, a strong proponent of the Bandung non-aligned movement sounded the death knell to pan-Arabism and to the great benefits it offered and could bestow upon Arab nations if allowed to act in their interests. The current iteration of this aspect of Western control combines digital technologies with engineered military conflict through the immense power of the US, NATO, and Israeli military, industrial, and academic complex, fueling conflict zones across the globe while financing the imperial economies, de de delaying their decline. The latest set of interests brilliantly served by modern Zionism is the globalizing perspective dependent on recent digital militarized AI, which you all know about, crucial to the Israeli MIAC and to its hold over many countries through the supply of the latest military and security technologies. Just think of Israel's role in Myanmar, Azerbaijan, Sudan, India, and now most European countries, and you see where this is leading. This is not just a spread of technological means of repression and subjugation, but also of a state of mind, that of the normalization of armed conflict, which so typifies modern Zionism, forming its polity and culture, as argued in my recent book, An Army Like No Other. Israel presents itself as the purveyor and enabler of order, providing means of controlling and subjugating not just national enemies, but also the national subaltern, never to be fully trusted, of course. In reality, what it spread is suffering, death, and destruction well beyond Palestine. I hope this raises some related questions and issues. For example, that of normalizing Israel in the developing world, and especially in Arab and Muslim influential polities. This happens not because Zionism is a force for the good, but exactly because it excels at death and destruction, which it developed and tested on the back and the cost of the Palestinians, turning Palestine into an oppressive laboratory for an oppressive future. Finally, we might well ask, in what sense Israel is a Jewish state? What is Jewish about apartheid? What is Jewish about war crimes? What is Jewish about brutal military occupation and ethnic cleansing? Or the daily murder of the innocents? There is nothing Jewish about such twisted set of values. One's no faith I know should or could openly support. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, because can you all hear me? Uh, thank you for the organizers and also for the labor of everyone who got us here and are taking care of us. So in discussing Islamophobia in relation to the global war on terror, I want to center, start by centering a transnational abolitionist framework uh, that is informed and animated by feminist and anti-racist solidarities. It highlights how such solidarities interrupt U.S. state-sanctioned discourse of terror and the way it is mobilized to monitor citizenships and curtail political dissent premised on fear and hegemonic belongings within and across the U.S. And I'm focusing here on the U.S., but well beyond that. So before I talk a bit about this abolitionist, uh, transnational abolitionist framework, I just want to take a minute and unpack and refer to the two key terms in the title, Global War on Terror and Islamophobia. And uh, I draw on, Lisa mentioned, the importance of foregrounding temporal 
uh, or transtemporal and transspatial and transgeographic factors that problematize relegating the development of the global war on terror to a post 9-11 moment, as well as limiting its implementation to the bounds of the US nation. Uh, in terms of Islamophobia, I also build on conversations that we've been having uh, at this conference about the need to place uh, the violence against Muslims and Muslim adjacent and other minoritized communities within a US racial hierarchy that challenges the idea that the problem of Islamophobia is one of individual bias, emphasizing structures of violence and discrimination. And I, I won't belabor the point, but I'm happy to also discuss this more. I do stress here an understanding of Muslim identity as it is constructed and imagined by the state, producing a monolith that is very different from the lived realities of Muslims, with this monolith drawing in, through its construction, other minoritized positionalities, including Arab, broadly speaking, South Asian, Black, and other indigenous and other religious, racial, and national categorizations. So this is why I stress that the importance to challenge anti-Muslim racism needs to happen relationally and not in segmented ways. And I would argue through feminist and anti-racist solidarities. The second part of Islamophobia that I want to underscore, and that's something that uh, Sven uh, touched on uh, yesterday and discussed, is that the project of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism is a gendered project that holds sexism and misogyny as a central and core tenet. Uh, this logic targets uh, Muslim and Muslim adjacent men while either erasing Muslim women or rendering them hyper visible by selectively focusing on visibly Muslim women and who, uh, who wear the hijab, for instance. I would argue that the US security state has been more blatantly and overtly targeting Muslim women, including women perceived to be Muslim, marked, marking a noted development or expansion in the state's gendered Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism. Uh, of course, these uh, state-induced uh, targetings uh, uh, happen and operate in tandem with ongoing harassment and violence against visibly Muslim women in hijab, for instance, as well as institutional targeting, and specifically academic institutional targetings of political dissidents pursued by Muslim and Muslim adjacent women. And I think there are many in this room even that have been the subject of such targetings. These targetings lay bare the hypocrisies inherent in the US state's representation of Muslim women in the global south as helpless victims in need of rescue from their oppressive cultures, a discourse mobilized for imperial expansion and military gain well before and during the war on terror. In this way, Muslim women are often relegated to a role that is subservient uh, to their male counterparts. So the logic is that they should either be rescued from their men or be punished for not rebelling against them. Using a Palestinian-American Rasmiya Oudis case as an example, I contend that Muslim and Muslim adjacent women within the US and beyond are being increasingly prosecuted by the US security state, not only because of their proximity to what is construed as male so-called terrorism, but because of their own political activism reconstructed by the US state as counter to national security and thus needing to be curtailed and punished on the state level. So in addition to Rasmiya's case, of course we have the cases, for example, of uh, Linda Sarsour, uh, Ilhan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib, with Omar and uh, Tlaib being part of the uh, state uh, uh, governance, but also attacked from within it. Such forms of political activism extend, for instance, to women taking on clear and unapologetic pro-BDS positionalities, pro-Palestine, developing radical feminist community networks within and across racialized US communities, and other stances and activism that I'm happy to discuss and explain further, as well as thinking about you know, the, the timing of these uh, escalating uh, targetings and, and what context they're happening within. Um, another thing to draw on in relation to the abolitionist framework that I started with is that um, this framework highlights the intertwined aspects of settler colonialism 
in relation to US imperial projects, so connecting the so-called national to the global or the imperial, while also highlighting sites of intersection across seemingly discrete and separate settler colonial states, here with a focus on the US and Israel. Um, and, and one site that I myself am interested in and do work on is the site of uh, the detention and incarceration uh, site, which, and I emphasize the word detention and, uh, rather than prisons, given the absence of judicial process in uh, many of these sites, so it's, that's important to foreground. I'm also invested in challenging uh, this discourse and thinking uh, this, uh, through this discourse uh, uh, by uh, looking at cultural production uh, and including different forms of cultural production, listening and hearing from ex-detainees or current detainees about experiences that, uh, and, and cross-racial solidarities uh, that uh, fight and challenge these constructs and discourse. So I'll talk a bit about Rasmiya Oda's case as an example of the U.S. security state's increased uh, uh, and increasing criminalization of Muslim women within the U.S. and across the intertwined settler colonial context of the U.S. and Israel. While of course recognizing that the prosecution of Muslim men has been at the forefront of the global war on terror, with high profile cases including for example that of the Holy Land Five and other cases of Muslim men being prosecuted and criminalized by the US security state. And here it's interesting and we can talk more about it that uh, a lot of these prosecutions are also happening and being taken up by the same attorneys and, and uh, state attorneys, like for example in the case of the Holy Land Five uh, and all this case was prosecuted by this uh, attorney Barry Jones. So displaced with her family from their Palestinian village of Lifta, Aude, uh, after multiple displacements, emigrated to the US in 1994, moving first to Detroit and then to Chicago, obtaining her citizenship, her US citizenship in 2004. In Chicago, she became the associate director of the Arab American Action Network, and in 2006, established the Arab Women's Committee to specifically address the needs of Arab and Muslim immigrant and refugee women, providing services to around 600 Arab and Muslim women of all ages from working class backgrounds. And, and I think class here is an important aspect to think about. Throughout her work and activism in the US, Aude was vocal in her support of Palestinian rights and the BDS campaign and fighting the Israeli, Israel, uh, the Israeli state's violence against Palestinians. In 1969, while still living in the West Bank, Aude, at the age of 21, was arrested by the Israeli army along with her father and two sisters in a so-called Israeli military sweep. She was accused of taking part in a Jerusalem supermarket bombing that killed two Israelis and for another bombing of the British consulate in Jerusalem. At the time, Aude was a member of the uh, Palestinian Front of the Liberation of Palestine, PFLP, uh, which criminalized Aude and fellow members in the eyes of the Israeli state. After being tortured and subjected to sexual assault in Israeli prison, Aude was convicted by an Israeli military tribunal for her alleged participation in the bombings and was given by an Israeli military court two life sentences in Israeli prison. So she spent 10 years in the prison before being released in 1979 alongside 75 other Palestinian prisoners in exchange uh, to one uh, um, uh, Israeli prisoner. 45 years after her torture and imprisonment by the Israeli state and after having lived in the US for 19 years, Aude once again found herself contending with the same discourse of criminalization and guilt. This time, however, these discussions were taking place in the US in the context of accusations lobbied against Aude by the US government that she had allegedly lied on her US immigration and naturalization papers regarding her incarceration in Israel. After being indicted and arrested in October 2013, a U.S. court found Aude guilty in 2014 of a so-called unlawful procurement of citizenship, U.S. citizenship. A series of pre-trial court orders took place, during which Aude's torture and sexual assault at the hands of her Israeli interrogators were not allowed to be discussed in the U.S. courtroom. <clears throat> 
while evidence of, evidence of her conviction in the Israeli court was nevertheless used. This was due to a treaty that the U.S. had signed with Israel in 1998, going back to the importance of the 90s, titled, uh, and this treaty is titled, Treaty Between the Government of the United States of America and the Government of the State of Israel on Mutual Assistance in Criminal Matters. Signed in January 1998 by Bill Clinton in Israel and ratified by the U.S. Congress in October of that same year, this treaty, quote, enables law enforcement authorities and prosecutors to obtain evidence, information, and testimony abroad in a form admissible in the courts of the requesting state, unquote. In December 2016, the same month that a retrial for Ode was approved, case prosecutors brought forward additional charges claiming that Ode took part in a so-called terrorist activity and that she belonged to a designated terrorist organization, referring to PFLP, and this was a way to bypass Ode's PTSD defense that was being brought forward. So on March 23, 2017, after four years of intense scrutiny and court hearings, and in light of the most recent charges of terrorism lob uh, lobbied against her by the prosecution, Ade agreed to a plea bargain. This plea agreement would not subject her to additional jail time, but would lead, her to uh, lead to her eviction from the US and her deportation to Jordan and the stripping of her US citizenship. On September 20, 2017, at the age of 70 years old, Ode's denaturalization and deportation were finalized with dozens of her supporters bidding her farewell at Chicago's O'Hare Airport. So the conflation here of illegality, terrorism, immigration, and political activism, in Rasmiya's case, is a prime example of the increasing expansion of what I'm referring to as gendered Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism in the US to more overtly and blatantly punish women's political activism. Rasmiya's case, even when not explicitly or directly drawing on a religious or anti-Muslim rhetoric, is still intrinsically steeped in anti-Muslim racism, with Islam and Muslim here denoting stances and associations that are constructed, imagined, and curtailed as a threat to the nation, the US nation, across, also across intertwined settler colonial landscapes in context of the US and Israel. And in, in, uh, def in, in her defense and in um, speaking to uh, this treatment, there was a very strong and broad uh, feminist solidarity movement that uh, organized uh, around that, that was intersectional and uh, coalitional, and um, emphasizing resistance against settler colonial violence and Palestinian liberation. And a, a big spokesperson on that was uh, Angela Davis. Um, and this really produced an interlinked feminist discourse of dissent. Ade herself continued to participate in such coalitional efforts, even after her trial and conviction. In uh, 2017, she joined other prominent feminists in endorsing uh, what they called an international strike against male violence and in defense of reproductive rights on 8, 8 March, which is International Women's Day, connecting movements such as Black Lives Matter, the struggle against police brutality and mass incarceration, the demand for open borders and for immigrant rights, and for the decolonization of Palestine, uh, which they say are for us uh, the beating heart of this new feminist movement. And so this movement thus affirms a relational space that ultimately reconfigures the boundaries of racialized communities, placing them in critical transnational cross-racial and cross-ethnic frameworks. And so to end, I highlight the case of Rasmiya Audi here, not to exceptionalize her, but to exemplify the effect of state mechanisms that target individuals and communities through racist and gendered mechanisms. It also emphasizes the centrality of broad formations of intersectionist feminist politics that extend beyond the individual to emphasize coalitional feminist visions and praxis. Thank you. All right. Um, first, I want to start, as we have, by thanking Karina Abdullah for bringing me back to Doha. It's wonderful to be here. Um, and it's, we were just saying, it's been such an incredibly like, productive and exciting
space to be in conversation. So thank everyone for making this possible. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, so in our work, we theorize and situate Islamophobia, uh, as many of these other panelists do, through the framework of American empire. And I want to start there to offer both like a context and to cite our training with the caveat that I also have a co-chair who's in quote unquote old Arab Marxist. So I'm also in kind of that Marxist camp. Um, but even though, again, we're looking at the United States, I've actually been struck in thinking about the panel, this conference, and particularly because we're having this at the end of the conference, I think I want to think a little bit about some terms that we've perhaps overburdened but underdefined. And what I mean, is, and something that I hope our analysis will help to shed light on, is first Islam. Which Islam and which Muslims do we, do we mean? Empire. Which manifestations of empire do we mean? And then race, as race, right? So to start with, I was struck in the last two panels, I've kind of messed with this. I started taking notes this morning of certain Islams that I'm not sure that we've really discussed robustly in the conference. Um, with the exception of South Africa, we haven't really said much about Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we haven't said much about Iran or Syria. We've not discussed almost entirely, and again, the panel prior to this messes up a little bit, Latin America or the Caribbean. Right, where Islam is the fastest growing religion, along with evangelical Catholicism. Um, you messed this up, Haim, earlier, in that we had not really said anything about Russian Federation or Caucasian or Central Asian Muslims. Um, we've said very little about minoritized groups like Kurds. I think there's one mention. We had two mentions of Indonesia, the largest Muslim majority state in, in the world. Um, and again, similarly, the previous panel also messed this up, quote unquote, by mentioning uh, New Zealand and um, you know, Australasia for, for a brief moment. Um, and I bring this up because I hope that our presentation will, will shed light a little bit on maybe some of these blind spots, I think, that are deeply imbricated in US empire. Um, secondly, in terms of empire, of course, we're looking at US empire, but I really want to use our presentation as a way to think and expand the typology of empire, as well as hone our critique of the machinations of power, <laughs> to come back to the journalism panel, it is all about power, but also think about how empire really works. Uh, and then finally, race. We've, we've talked a bit about race, races and, and it, you know, Islamophobia, race and its sisters, to borrow from you of Sedgwick, you know, Islamophobia as related to and the family. We've used a lot of these sort of familial metaphors, I think, without really giving a lot of analytical precision to race as a concept that has a particular historical genealogy that I want us to kind of look a little bit more deeply at. So thus we argue, as some of the other panelists have, to understand Islamophobia and the war on terror, we need to look at you know, earlier histories right, that, that really complicate this story by offering messy moments of exception. Right? So though we, we agree, um, and I think you, we could not argue against this, that there is an intensification of racialized prejudice after 9-11 we have to understand this within a longer history of American empire and American power in the 20th and 21st, and even to a certain degree, 19th centuries. So with the overall goal of global hegemony and dominance, the US clearly identifies enemies and threats, but it also carves out exceptions specifically for the purpose of facilitation, because it's easier to collaborate than it is to pacify, as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan show us. So in this historical record, Islam and Muslims are never static enemies. And through a political economy analysis of capital, there are these, as I said, these messy moments of exception that emerge that we argue we really need to think about in a serious way. So in our argument, if we define race through Ruth Wilson Gilmore's concept of race as proximity to state-sanctioned death, we argue that this proximity is not evenly distributed among this broad and capacious category of Muslim. You see, I want to think about attention to which Islam, which Muslim world we're mapping, and that this differential allows for coercion that is not outright conquest by settler or military means. So what I'm going to talk about uh, in the first half of our presentation are 20th century examples about this kind of exception to set us up for talking about the war on terror. Um, so there are many, many moments of U.S. collaboration and accommodation, particularly with countries like Turkey or Iran, uh, around the First World War and the Cold War. Uh, I'm going to focus on, and again, not our yesterday sort of scooped, if we can use that journalistic language, like talk about Saudi, but we'll return to that. Um, and I want to be clear that the sort of marking of geopolitical hierarchies and status applied to both strategic national partners as well as individual subjects moving through the world. Um, and particularly the treatment and interpolation of these subjects. 
And I want to be clear, this is not to diminish the reality of Islamophobia, um, but it is to say that in the first half of the 20th century, in the 19th century, when racism as race, right, as a, as a race science, right, and eugenic policies were preeminent, um, it haunted the development of oil in the region, it haunted the resource extraction in the region. Um, but in this sort of Darwinist competition of nations, right, and creations of racial hierarchies, it relied on a much more abstruse and complicated racial schema than I think we imagine. And what I mean in particular is one, in this moment, everyone invokes whiteness, right? So I'm, I'm deeply invested in thinking relationally, right? But I want us to also think about the relationship to whiteness that is invoked by, and I hate to tell us this, everyone at the turn of the century, right? From Japanese Americans, Hindu Indian Americans, Arab Americans, Armenian Americans, right? Who are litigating for whiteness for the sake of occupying this privileged structural position, right? But it's also invoked by Turkish nationalist, Arab nationalist, Armenian nationalist, Hindu nationalist projects, right? Really when these, these projects as such get off the ground, we're similarly invoking whiteness. Um, and to give you an example, which uh, because it's come up a few times and a few scholars have now taken this up, we discussed the Ground Zero Mosque. It came up in a few panels, right? And, and some scholars have now unearthed there actually was already a mosque in what became Ground Zero. It was the Ottoman Mosque, right, which opens 1906, right around the Ottoman Consulate, right, which has a major presence in what is then Little Syria, um, and is covered by both government and popular journalist, journalist, right, whether American or Ottoman, and seems to be set up largely to spy on auto, other Ottoman subjects, right? There are many kinds of unruly Ottomans in this one, particularly Armenians who are not going there, right? But they're also concerned about particularly Albanian Muslims who they think might also come to the United States and go back to the Ottoman Empire imbued with these dangerous ideas about equality or rights or nationalisms. I can talk more about that and again, particularly race science, which is where my head is at in my own kind of like evolving research in this moment. To give you another example, which again, I really want to focus on, is Saudi Arabia post-1945. Um, so as the US is concerned about European and global access to oil, it's willing to work with not just the secular states that several people have talked about, um, but also the Saudis, right, and other Islamic-identified non-secular states. So to give you some data points, Saudis included in Lend-Lease, which we often, again, like, forget or occlude, meaning that the US and the Allied powers intensified security partnerships, even when the Saudis were at odds with democratizing or modernizing efforts. But as I want to flag in thinking about the Ottoman mosque, this is already old rather than new statecraft, right? Um, though I guess also in this moment I want to flag that there is a belief among many intellectuals, <laughs> academics, as well as people in government, that Islam, like any religion, is just going to fade away. Right? This, of course, doesn't, this is not true, right? Religion does not fade away from <laughs> the world in the last 50 years. But there's this kind of belief that, oh, well, we can ally. It's a temporary partnership. So in this moment, the Saudis were a Cold War bulwark against not only communism, as had been Turkey and Iran, but also Arab nationalist revolutionary movements, particularly Nasser, as we talked about, Palestinians, right? And this is, again, part and parcel of US efforts to, to partner with regimes that would suppress things like Palestinian rights, Palestinian nationalism. The other example, um, an obvious one, but one really worth unpacking, is the Mujahideen in the 1980s, right? In another moment in which the CIA, through Operation Cyclone, pours billions of dollars, right? Again, to the enemy of my enemy, right? Who they see as being pro-US interests. We know how this plays out, but this is another moment in which proxy wars are a means to an end, right? And allying with unlikely allies, or again, as we kind of want to argue, likely Muslim allies, right, is tried and true American foreign policy. So there's a logic of political practicality that is backed with the might of the US dollar throughout, again, the, the long 20th century. Um, so again, just to, to segue into um, Zainab's portion, in the 20th century, we see that Islam and Muslim are incredibly broad and capacious categories that are not necessarily antithetical to US or again, another kind of perhaps overloaded and undefined term, Western um, power, uh, and such that Islam, Muslim are not even necessarily tethered to Islam, right, or even terrorism. Um, and the US cultivates national partners, political allies based on utility. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Is my poor thing? I can't actually tell. No? Oh, no. Nope. Oh, there we go. I think that's my hair. Um, all right, to take that from um, Thomas into the 21st century, what we see changing is that there is indeed this clear coalescing of, of terrorists as vaguely Arab, South Asian, black, and Muslim, and threatening to the US in this, in this very fixed way so that even these older partnerships are threaded through with deeper distrust, as we see with Pakistan, with Iraq, Afghanistan, Persian Gulf. And so we want to be clear again that these, there is a very real surge of prejudice with potentially deadly consequences for those who could be read as Muslim, such as when um, Bilbir Singh said he was killed four days after 9-11 um, as, as the first kind of hate crime um, for seeming Muslim. Um, so this is, this is a very real phenomenon that we, we're not trying to underplay in, in, in kind of emphasizing exception. Um, but if we do define race in this way of, of proximity to state-sanctioned death, um, we're arguing that even after 9-11, there's still this continuity in which capital is what makes the difference between who is eligible for partnership and who is fair game to be targeted for kind of ominously in intervention, um, even within that broad and capacious category of Muslim. And so, um, to take Saudi Arabia again as an example, it bears repeating that the 9-11 hijackers were of Saudi origin. And yet when the Bush administration was making its war plans immediately after discovering that the, the planes had hit the towers, that, that Saudi was not what, what Dick Cheney was thinking about um, immediately um, in that moment. And, and, and Saudis were never kind of eligible to be gone to war with um, the way that Afghanistan and then Iraq would be. And so a 2016 New York Times headline, you know, arrestingly called Saudi Arabia, quote, both the arsonists and the firefighters, unquote, in the global project of US counterterrorism. And that is a spectacular image of ambivalence that speaks to something deeper that is happening here. And so, you know, Trump as president was frequently crass about the way he phrased things, but he made explicit the implicit economic logic that has guided American administrations for, for decades. Um, staying allied with Saudi Arabia is good for business, despite, in Trump's case, the blatant rhetoric that he weaponized through, to take just one example, um, the Muslim ban as, as his first act of, pres of the presidency. Um, and so you see that there are these ways of, of eluding um, intervention um, through capital. Meanwhile, you have the imperialist, but specifically an imperialist capitalist or uh, logic that ordered the justifications for invading Iraq and Afghanistan that we're not just socially and politically backward, but we're, we're deviant economic actors as well. That in Afghanistan, countless, I mean, the cost of war project has tried to count, but, but it's, it's seemingly countless amount of money spent on a new Afghan state to integrate into the US sphere of influence. Um, and, and it has been known since the late 1990s by American politicians and businessmen that um, Afghanistan had these untapped, um, unexploited natural mineral, gas, and oil deposits um, that because of the state's political fragility had not really been mined. Um, and, and in Iraq, it wasn't just that we were ousting Saddam and, and trying to neutralize these WMDs. Um, the liberation of Iraq was specifically through the installation of a modern capitalist democracy via a free market revolution. So you have Paul Bremer passing orders to, to open up the trade borders, take off the tariffs, while Baghdad's streets were literally still burning. Um, and so this, this mode of capital as, um, as General David Petraeus put it better than I could in his, one of his training manuals for the army in 2009, money as a weapon system. Um, so this, this guide that is called the Commander's Guide to Money as a Weapon System for Counterinsurgency, um, the role of capital is, is explicit and foregrounded. And so that, that money as a weapon system can be a textbook policy that articulates quite literally the continuity that we are identifying, that representatives of the US military and empire are well aware that capital can be used to discipline, as in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as to coerce and collaborate, as with Saudi Arabia. Either way, there is this market for war with profitable incentives to cooperate. And um, as I study private military contracting, including, you know, as we talked about, um, Israel's role in, 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 in this political economy, I can speak more to that in the Q&A if there's interest. But to conclude, um, you know, we want to argue that Islamophobia can be theorized perhaps less as a cogent racism in its own right, um, and more as a discourse that has these elements of, of, you know, of political melodrama with victims and, and enemies. But 
but really we can think about it as well as rationalizing heuristic for a global campaign to restore and sustain American hegemony post 9-11 beyond these traditional boundaries of wars between states. So in the US context, Islamophobia lends a narrative coherence to what was always the project of US empire and capitalism. Um, and so it is therefore important, we argue, to recenter political economy in our analysis to tune to the ways in which US empire can mark and unmark threats to the evolving conditions required for it to endure. Thank you so much. So before I turn to my questions, I'd like to just remind the audience that you can scan the barcode on, the, on your table in order to submit questions. Please go ahead and do that. Um, okay, so for Lisa, very quickly, I'd like to actually invite you uh, to talk more about the concept of elastic sovereignty, which you touched on very briefly in your discussion. Sure. Yeah. Great. Sure, no problem. Um, so, as I was mentioning in the, the brief comments today, a lot of my work is tracing how U.S. material support law, um, which has its origin in the 1990s and is greatly expanded upon um, through a host of technologies and such in the early, early aughts, really, um, embeds into U.S. financial flows, aid flows, banking transactions around the world, and sort of how it effectively sort of exports, right, the U.S. criminal legal regime um, far beyond the territorial borders of the U.S. Um, into the intimate spaces of those those populations that receive aid, and my work is particularly looking at Palestine. So how this executive order I talked about and the material support ban is effectively infused, right, into humanitarian and development aid flows in Palestine. So Palestinians are forced to engage in very intimate ways with the punitive carceral security state of Washington's counterterrorism regime, right, and how that sort of inaugurates a whole host of, of criminalization and policing practices within Palestine. And I sort of track how this law is um, operating, fragmenting, creating kind of divisions between who can receive aid, who can have water network systems, who can get food aid, and all those sorts of things. You have to sort of not be on these lists that I was sort of tracking. So really in short, looking at how kind of the, how US criminal law is operating through these monetary flows that traverse the world. And this is something that we're seeing increasingly more pertinent in terms of how um, you know, so everything that's converted to USD right, effectively activates the US criminal regime. Um, and so, so you see sort of people that are, right, um, have monetary transactions that don't even come into the US but transit through a US banking institution effectively activates this stuff. And so it's sort of, I'm a geographer, so I think about nerdy geography stuff, like I write about topology and sort of how it is that right, people are forced to intimately engage with Washington when they're, say, 6,000 miles away. Um, so that's sort of, in short, how I think about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Farhaim, thank you very much. Uh, so part of uh, Zionists, Zionism's racial logics are not just the way Zionism treats Palestinians, but also the creation of an internal racialized hierarchy within Israel itself. Um, and so in, of course, Israel's recent history, there have been noted moments of black and brown Jewish Israelis finding common political ground with Palestinians who are similarly racialized. Is there, is that space foreclosed in the current moment? Is there an opportunity for this to happen in the current moment in given Israeli politics? And it's sort of turned very sort of severe certain to the right, but also given the larger sort of logics that are emerging within the, the next stage of the global war on terror? It's a very good question, and the answer is normally painful. Um, both in the United States and in Britain, uh, Jews um, since the beginning of the 20th century uh, were on the right side. In other words, on the left side. Um, so, you know, we know about New York and other, uh, you know, Chicago as well, where, you know, Jews were um, supporting um, other uh, struggles of, uh, of similar groups. Uh, this is true uh, about the struggle against fascism in Britain, for example. Um, you probably heard about the Battle of Cable Street where the fascists move into uh, the Jewish quarter uh, around Cable Street um, and the Jews fought back together with left-wing and unionist forces against the fascists. So there is this history also with black and brown um, colleagues uh, in the struggle that uh, should be um, 
you know, uh, treasured and, and followed and continued. Um, we've lost that. And why we've lost it is quite complicated and not the same in Britain and the US uh, or Canada. Uh, but in both cases, Jews have moved class-wise um, up. And um, when you move uh, classes, you move ideologies, you uh, trade in your old beliefs. Uh, also, uh, I think that Jews in New York, for example, on the whole, uh, came from uh, the Russian Empire and its environs and were influenced uh, even before the um, 1917 by socialist ideologies. So when they found themselves um, in the turmoil of uh, beginning of 20th century New York, um, they read it through their experience and acted accordingly. Uh, this is gone, and it's gone mainly because of Israel, because of Zionism, because Zionism uh, has offered a Jewish identity which is um, nailed to the mast of the Israeli flag and, 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 and ideology. So in a sense, uh, Jewish groups outside of Israel have traded um, a very complex identity um, until 1948. Until 1948, no Jewish community in Europe uh, and of course the United States supported Zionism uh, by one than more percent. One percent typically was supporting Zionism across the Jewish world. Um, you know, the six million Jews uh, who were killed were not Zionists. So in a sense, we lost the anti-Zionist in the Holocaust uh, because a lot of them were Bundists. Uh, and we ended up uh, with this little uh, cologne in Palestine that actually affected millions of Jews in the United States and Britain. So in a sense, this is a process that is very difficult to undo. However, I want to be slightly positive about one area, and that's the United States. Young Jews in the United States are very progressive in comparison to people their age uh, 50 years ago. Um, they are uh, not supportive of Zionism, they are supportive of Palestine. Uh, this is not an easy thing for them to do, and yet they do it. Uh, I live in uh, London, and there is nothing like this in London. Um, actually, the older people in London are in, on the left, the older Jews are on the left in great numbers, uh, but um, young Jews are yet to learn from their cousins uh, in, in the United States. So, in a sense, there is a little hope, uh, and it is um, mainly uh, in North America. Um, of course, there is no hope in Israel. I don't need to say this, even though half the population is now in the streets claiming that the other half is fascist. Well, they're all fascists. They have different styles, so we shouldn't be, compl we shouldn't be confused by style here. Uh, some of them prefer uh, to say um, openly that they want to get to the, the rid of the Palestinians and the other just want to do it um, and not talk about it. But basically, no hope in Israel. If you are waiting for um, a solution coming f out from progressive Israel, forget it now. This is not going to happen. The only thing that is going to happen is a South African solution uh, from outside, from a united front ac across the world supporting Palestine and supporting equality and supporting justice and the refugees. Nothing will come out of Israel which will help anybody, including Jews. Thank you. Uh, Carol, um, one of the interesting things about Asmi Aoudi's case and the way that it has been discussed in multiple types of documents, but primarily in the media, is there's been no indication of what her religion is, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting, and I think actually is, is crucial because uh, 
while this is about Islamophobia, right, and there is a conversation about it being Muslims, right, the, the, the sort of terminology that came up yesterday and which you took up today, which being Muslim adjacent, I think is critical mm -hmm. to how the logics of the global war on terror function. Mm -hmm. So can you address that a little bit more, if you would? And also just to uh, maybe to add on a, a smaller s subsidiary question, which is, has Aude's case been a gateway case for shaping feminist activism or solidarity um, networks in the US since 2017. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Yes, you're absolutely right that, you know, a quick overview, let's, if we look at the coverage uh, of uh, all this case, um, the against and the support of her, there's, yes, there's, very, there's not mention, there's not much mention about her religious, uh, uh, identity or affiliation. So, and and I think the question is not and should not be, uh, is the Muslims for us to determine whether what she's experiencing is a form of Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism? So I think you know, rather than that question, then we we you know where. Um, we would, we would be more invested in thinking or asking the question, how is the shutting down of political or what is seen as political dissent or political intervention, pro-Palestinian interventions, pro-BDS, how are, is the shutting down of, the, of that kind of activism and outspokenness being funneled uh, at the intersections of racism and uh, misogyny? You know, so I, th I think, you know, that, that is the question because if we want to adhere to, you know, like if, if Aude is Muslim or not, and then we can determine whether that's Islamophobia, that a, becomes a limited way to assert and challenge uh, uh, how, and mostly challenge, how um, anti-Muslim racism um, is, is mobilizing around these axes. Um, so, and then in, in uh, relation to how is her case a gateway, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge gateway, right? It's, it's really important because it has mobilized feminists across the board and it's also formed coalitions of brown and black feminist activists that respond to Zionist um, responses, right? So there was a piece uh, that, um, you know, where this uh, uh, white Jewish uh, journalist was denouncing the fact that Rasmiya Aude as a so-called terrorist uh, joined uh, the, um, the group uh, of, uh, you know, the, uh, the feminist coalition uh, supporting the strike. Uh, in 2017, and and so around that, there's an understanding that formations of the formulations and formations of these feminist interventions need to cut across. Like there, there's no success of these coalitions if they don't um, uh, position these relational uh, stances that they mentioned in their in their statement, and and that becomes a real, uh, uh, you know, at the foreground of these feminist formulations. Um, and along with that, I think there are these, like there's outspoken feminist stances. I'm also interested in looking at how community uh, uh, mobilization happened around Jasmiya Aude. So she was directing the American uh, Committee, a Women's Committee, and I was struck by the, you know, the ten, the dozens of women from that center who went and supported her in court, right? And I'm interested also, through her work with them, they published a collection of stories written by these uh, uh, refugee and immigrant women speaking about their experiences of alienation, displacement, um, struggling, you know, within the US. So I'm interested in those uh, formulations, uh, creative formulations, as sites of activism and sites of feminist mobilization. Right, so there's that that really augments and foreground uh, the work that activists are, are doing on the ground and, and uh, uh, through different feminist organizations across racial uh, and ethnic and national identities. Zainab and uh, Thomas, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question that actually collects some of the themes that have come up. So in thinking about 
the circulations of capital that Lisa talking about and the ways in which right Zionism and Israel has kind of you know played its hand in multiple conflicts now even outside of the region and also thinking about the sort of Muslim adjacent or sort of non-Muslim aspect of Islamophobia. Is there a way that we can, and taking up your call, Thomas, that there are a lot of topics and, and spaces of conflict that we haven't talked about in this conference. So what I would like to ask you guys is, is there a way to read a conflict like Artsakh, like Nagorno-Karabakh, through the logics of Islamophobia and the global war on terror, as an example? Oof. <laughs> why did you take that one? <laughs> well, not that I want to take that one, but yeah, I mean, and, and I want to be clear also, it's a kind of annoying academic, like, rhetorical posture to say, oh, you know what, at the end, you didn't say this. And, like, that kind of, like, you know, stands in for, like, actual analysis or expertise. That's not what I intend to do here, right? But, but I think, yeah, so in, in mapping the world, I think that I would say, okay, if we're going to map the sort of broader, you know, broader implications of Zionism and normalization and, you know, again, what is now a more than a century of Euro-American support for the Zionist colonial project, well, we actually can't map that world if we don't map Turkey and Iran, right, in the 1940s. We actually similarly can't map that world if we don't map especially Saudi and the Emirates and in Morocco, those leading normalization efforts. And that's, I think, also where we have, we need to map and sort of, I literally do this with my students, right? I love a map. And I'd say, like, let's map these connections and let's map these alliances and let's map where Rhetoric is mobilized cynically and may not actually, for lack of a better word, map onto, especially these military alliances with the flows of capital or especially military materiel. So to think about, again, my goal was not actually to talk about Artsakh now, but I do think that we would be remiss if we didn't connect these broader dots and say, okay, what does it mean that the first time I'm in Doha, right, occurs after Trump's I don't know, magical orb picture, you know what I mean, in which we see the Saudis and the Emirates are so emboldened and initiate a blockade. I don't think it's an accident that normalization happens after that. I don't think it's an accident that Azerbaijan, you know, has been able to parlay its incredible oil wealth into both, in some ways, radicalizing Turkish foreign policy, right, and enabling Turkish military adventurism across the region, but, but also profiting from Israeli military technology and technicians in this conflict in, in, in Artsakh. So I think that in this particular instance, as a scholar, I would say I'm interested in the difference and the distance between rhetoric and material realities. You know, what does it mean that we can, in the West especially, frame, with the exception of certain um, activists who have made a quite explicit connection between Artsakh and Afghanistan, and Janine, and ethnic cleansing that is happening across the world, by the bad guys that we know, I don't think we can do, we have to be thinking about, well, how does Islamophobia in some ways distract from these flows of capital? You know what I mean? Or how can it be mobilized cynically by spaces to say, oh, you, this is just Islamophobia in a way that has been learned from Israel, <laughs> right? You know, I also think it's a, a missed connection to say um, the laws that are used to dispossess Armenians after the genocide are replicated almost verbatim in some cases, in the laws that dispossess Palestinians. And then you see another sad parallel in that, like, you know, Palestinians then find themselves in refugee camps that were initially created to serve as camps for Armenians. So this sort of empire is empire, and empire rhymes. And I think that that's where I would say following the money <laughs> really, really helps us to, to and what basically the, the mandates of capital. Right, what does facilitating the flow of capital, resource extraction, and goods show us about how empire and military you know, flows function? So yeah, I would also like to add on just that um, when we follow the capital, we have to follow the companies, we have to follow the profit. Yeah. So when I look at contra the reason I study contractors to study US empire is because all of these state and military projects, I mean, who makes the guns, you know, who makes the computer systems, Google is a military contractor. Amazon is a military contractor. They do the cloud services. These are huge billion, trillion dollar contracts that we're talking about over time. And, um, and there are these, you know, when you wed the political kind of state prerogative of national security with the incentive of profit, um, when you have, you know, Lockheed doesn't just make its planes by itself, it collaborates with Israeli companies, it collaborates with, with all kinds of companies to, to make the parts that then are tested on Palestinians, that are tested on the US-Mexico borderlands, that are 
um, are really making all of these state projects possible. So um, to really kind of highlight that there is this, this market for war, and it's a very heterogeneous market um, that involves a lot of different corporate actors who, um, by virtue of not being the state, um, have the ability to act with greater political and legal impunity. Um, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars were contracted out to the extent that you had one point something to one ratios of contractors to soldiers. Mm -hmm. and, and less than 10% of them were ever armed like Blackwater. Um, so this is a really major economy that is not just private security, that is not just one thing, but that is making all these other things possible. So we have to also think about non-state power in upholding state power. Certainly. Um, I don't know if you know this, Thomas, but um, 20 years before um, the Armenian uh, genocide by Turkey, Herzl is going to Palestine uh, via Istanbul and seeing the, you know, uh, the caliph in Istanbul. And um, basically, he has offered already uh, European potentates um, to control the Muslims. But n now he, he uh, which he offers also in Turkey, because of course Turkey has a problem with Palestinians and Syrians and so on. But he has got a, a winning uh, offer. He offers to control the Armenians in Europe. 20 years before the, that whole thing happens, um, the Turks actually think about this because he's a very influential uh, German language um, journalist, uh, well known, uh, and he could um, serve them uh, very well in that. In the end, they decide not to touch him. Uh, but I thought uh, it should be mentioned that already then they were thinking about what we can, what can we offer to the different empires around us, including a, a Muslim empire, to, to control the, the subalterns. Okay, so now we're going to turn f to some questions by our audience. Um, the first one, um, I'm actually going to open up to open it up to the whole panel, which is how have social movements like Black Lives Matter addressed the overlap of racism and Islamophobia? Can you repeat that? Sorry. That last I'm, one? Oh, yes. How have social movements like Black Lives Matter addressed the overlap of racism and Islamophobia? Any takers? If they have. I, I'm thinking for a second. I was, but my, my instinct is um, I think that there have been really exciting, mm, to offer a measured response. I've been there, there have been exciting convergences and also I think quite painful differences. Like I'm thinking of a few examples. We see that, you know, immediately after, you know, Ferguson happens, right, in many ways, which is formative in, in the growth of BLM, we see solidarity efforts that are multi directional, you know, between Palestinian activists as well as like black activists, you know, in the States. So there's a way that there is, people are, are making these connections, you know what I mean, and saying, wait, in a way that feels actually, we've lost a lot of this sort of, the possibility of, of liberatory third worldism, you know what I mean, and understanding that the struggle is global. You see, I think, some activists mapping this in quite savvy ways, but you also see um, these solidarities being foreclosed in, in certain ways. I'm thinking of like, you know, the Women's March in which we saw like, you know, there was a tons of, hoopla, right, you know, and criticisms of BLM as being anti-Semitic by virtue of continuing to engage and wanting to free Palestine, you know, as a part of a broader BLM, if we could, foreign policy vision, you know, so I think there are ways that it's, they're certainly being policed in similar ways, I think people are making connections, and I'm so excited by these global connections, this is where I'm optimistic, which I never am. Um, optimistic, I think, in that we really have to have a global vision, and some activists are taking this up. I would caution everyone that if we are not thinking in these terms, conservative and repressive and fascist forces really are. <laughs> and that's why we could see someone like Herzl saying, yes, do you know what? We are nice white Europeans. You, many of you in power, also nice Balkan Muslims. You are also white Europeans. We have something in common. There are these problematic indigenous folks that we can suppress, right? So conservatives are making these sorts of connections. So I am always like, yes, more. <laughs> Please make more of these connections. In t and think globally because they're so deeply interconnected and I think that sort of vision is, is lost because it's policed so, so aggressively. I don't know, I'm being 
Anyone I'm, else? I'm also thinking, you know, the logics governing some, of, you know, that question or the, the logic behind it is that these are two separate uh, tracks, you know, and, and the exciting um, coalitions and solidarities that we see coming out of uh, uh, Ferguson in relation to Palestine uh, is also an acknowledgement that these are intersecting tracks, right? Like we cannot only think about uh, Palestinian liberation movements in parallel with black liberation movements because these intersect in real, material, important ways. And, and now there's a very exciting conversations happening around, you know, uh, black Muslims uh, and how, you know, the communities who identify and are positioned at the intersections of, of these seemingly parallel and separate uh, a community, so what happens when we do bring them together and have those conversations? I think also, uh, Palestinians are very quick on the uptake of things like Ferguson. Um, of course, maybe thousands of Palestinians um, have found themselves in the same position of George Floyd before he was murdered by the policeman. Um, by restricting uh, his breathing. Um, this is a, a technology of control uh, that the Israelis have uh, taught in the United States and in other countries. Um, they are training um, the most horrible forces everywhere in the methods that they have perfected. So that's one half of the, uh, this is Thomas's point. Um, the other thing is, um, I remember that when Avatar came out, uh, the massive uh, growth of Palestinian uh, groups that painted themselves blue. And that was really excellent to see, you know, the whole social media was overnight full of blue Palestinians and everyone got the message, yeah? So they also picked up the message uh, from Black Lives Matter, but I have to say, that I'm not sure that the Black Lives Matter have picked up the connection to the same effect. In, in other words, we're waiting to hear the answer from Black Lives Matter um, that they are sensitized to Palestine in the way that the Palestinians are sensitized to the black uh, struggle. Uh, from Palestine, which is a small place, isolated, without uh, much power whatsoever, I think the Black Lives Matter movement is stronger than Palestine. Um, sure, I don't have much to add, but just to sort of echo uh, some of what Carol was saying, that yeah, I think there are some really interesting synergies happening between um, sort of Black Lives Matter movement, the Black Lives Matter movement and Palestine solidarity activism, in part because of how both are being criminalized to the nth degree. Um, by both laws, policing tactics, surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. So I think these connections are being made. I don't know if they're still happening, but I know there were um, sort of groups um, of young um, political activists in the US connected to BLM that were going to Palestine um, to learn firsthand about the sort of oppression that Palestinians are facing and bringing those tools back. Um, and there's a lot of interesting connections around policing, right? How sort of thinking about following like capital and policing practices and the fact that, right, a lot of, right, um, Israel's training US police forces. I mean, people are making, young people are making these connections and I think we're sort of on the other end, we're not sort of up to speed of what kind of connections they're actually leading with. So um, yeah, I think that stuff, there is some really interesting kind of, center, there are some interesting synergies happening um, right now, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, next question. How does neocolonial feminism contribute to gender-based Islamophobia? Sorry, can you repeat? How does neocolonial feminism contribute to gender-based Islamophobia? It's <laughs> not specified to whom this is directed, but I imagine Carol, but obviously anyone can jump in. Well, I mean, I think these coalitions that I mentioned um, are really combating and responding to, you know, uh, what we refer to as state feminism, neocolonial feminism, white feminism, and we see that we saw that struggle with the women's march, right? Like these factionalism, right? So, in order to think about, yeah, gendered Islamophobia again does not 
um, operate in isolation of racial understandings, of colonial understandings, of imperial understandings, right? So the state level discourse has been about foregrounding, you know, uh, Muslim women as in need of being rescued and all that. And, and so to kind of respond to that is to poke holes in that kind of discourse and, and see how racialized um, uh, women, uh, including Muslim women, are being brutalized uh, within a U.S. context, you know, and so the kind of ironies and paradoxes that that, uh, that, that brings forth. So that's, that's really important. And, um, and to kind of, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about a piece that Noura Irakat uh, uh, wrote in response and in defense of Rasmiya Oudeh, and the title of that piece is, When You Come for Rasmiya Oudeh, You Come for All of Us, right? And I'm really intrigued by that um, construction of the us, uh, in that title, and I don't think Noura is referring to that us as from her standpoint, maybe as an Arab or a Palestinian, but there's a collective that's being evoked uh, there that really is one that is coalitional uh, and one that understands that uh, there are um, uh, com commonalities in the way communities are brutalized uh, uh, within a U.S. context, but well beyond that, so that us is not... Uh, one that is exclusive, but one that, and us that is invitational, acknowledging that power and, and that history of colonialism and imperialism. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have yeah, something. Um, I'm thinking of two moments. I'm thinking of early on in the Afghanistan war when you have Laura Bush advocating for uh, liberating Afghan women, and that's the reason that, you know, Taliban are basically, you know, at this point, not 2000, late 2001, early 2002, like not considered to be the enemy that they would be with the with the uh, insurgency later, but um, the, the reason to stay and to state build specifically um, and to have this kind of donor coalition to to stay in Afghanistan on this longer term basis um, was to, to liberate the women. So this idea that, you know, that it's not like they're not gendered, as we've seen in previous discussions, like there's not not gender problems, you know, in, in the Middle East and in the United States and in Europe and, and, and everywhere. And so um, the idea that we need to kind of fixate on, on the, you know, do we need to save Muslim women narrative um, really limits uh, the potential for kind of gender solidarities. Um, so, so in that sense, a kind of neo-imperial feminism. Um, and I'm also thinking of kind of a neoliberal feminism of, you know, when you think about like the US military taking all these diversity initiatives to, to diversify um, the army to, you know, the, the joke of, well, at least the person dropping the the, the drone attack was a was a person of color or like was a woman you know and so uh, as as though that's better you know that do we want like which cat identity category do we want dropping the drone bomb you know so so I'm kind of thinking of those moments where we kind of do not kind of center empire and to center um, you know an anti-war kind of leaning um, when we think about um, how we're trying to act in solidarity or how we're trying to you know on the one hand here try to you know help women be part of you know to lean in i guess um and to to have greater um economic power domestically but if you're doing that through the military industrial sort of mess um so what does that mean so um i think that yeah you have to be careful about these solidarities and, and how you are trying to to articulate um, what advancement and liberation means for you, you know, in your home space, um, and how you interact with people on the global stage. Yep. Uh, Carol, and then home, and then we're closing I after just this. Wanted yeah. to quickly add something that you know, in thinking about gendered Islamophobia or gendered anti-Muslim racism, I think it's also important to acknowledge that this is not only about women. Right? Because we see how men and detainees and uh, men labeled as terrorists have been folded into this logic of, of gender, right? Like we, we've seen that in, in detention uh, centers and the treatment of detainees that are sexualized and racist but are based on premises and logics that are assumptive, right? Like assuming that, oh, this is what these Muslim men are going, this is what a, what's going to break them based on their religion yeah. and, and their yeah. culture and, and, and these very uh, racist understandings and assumptions of, of, of uh, uh, these Muslim men. So it's really important that like the gendering is also happening in, rela in relation to 
n not only women. Yeah. 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 Last very quick comment. Um, yeah. Two examples which you all know. One is French feminists fighting against the veil. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Very Islamophobic move. Um, instead of standing with women who are actually powerless, yeah. they are fighting them. The other, even more uh, bizarre, uh, but totally understandable and totally unjustified, is um, Israeli feminists um, fighting for the right to be in fighting units, in front units mm -hmm. that go to the territories. And they won that a few years ago and uh, advertised the victory on social media as if it was the best thing that ever happened, which for them it must have been, you know. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all. Before we close, I just want to tell a, to a reminder that we are now taking a very short 15-minute break. Please reconvene at 4 p.m. for our closing roundtable discussion moderated by Firat Uruch. Um, please help me welcome, thank you. <laughs> please help me welcome and thank our panelists. <laughs> thank you all so much. <laughs>